So, the continuity with King Neptune is a bit of a mess. There are two different King Neptunes. There's a King Poseidon. There's three different royal palaces. Two of them are called the City of Atlantis, but there's also a third unrelated City of Atlantis. It's confusing to say the least. But there is actually a way to explain how all of this is intentional and connects together. This is a story of power, deception, and betrayal. This is the Neptune Theory. Now on to the theory! King Neptune is the ruler of the Seven Seas and the Roman god of the ocean. If you watch my evolution theory, you know there's also a good chance he's the reason why fish and bikini bottom are so evolved and able to talk. He lives in the city of Atlantis with his wife Queen Amphitrite and his son Triton. But in the first Spongebob movie, he's replaced by a completely different King Neptune who has a completely different daughter named Mindy. These guys don't look or sound at all the same, so how can they both exist in this universe? Well, there's already an interesting... <laughs> It's widely believed that the Spongebob movie takes place in the future after the events of the show. So widely believed that I got hundreds of comments about it in my Mrs. Puff theory. Yep, I, I know. I know, guys. I heard, I heard what you said. The creator of Spongebob, Steven Hillenburg, said he wanted to end the series with the movie. And it being canonically at the end of the Spongebob timeline would explain why we never see the Krusty Krab 2 or any of the other characters from the movie in the later Spongebob episodes. And some people believe that the reason why movie Neptune is so different is because he's actually Neptune's son, Triton all grown up. And that's a pretty cool theory, but I don't buy it. Other than Triton looking nothing like movie Neptune, I've never actually believed that the Spongebob movie takes place in the future. Despite there being many, many people who commented about it on my Mrs. Puff theory as if it was a proven fact, there's never actually been any official confirmation of it. Steven Hillenburg only said that he wanted to stop making Spongebob after the movie. He never said anything about where the movie actually takes place in the timeline of the show. And we do actually briefly see Neptune's daughter Mindy show up later in the show in Spongebob's Big Birthday Blowout. Out. There's no way she'd be there unless the show took place after the events of the movie. I think what's actually going on here with Neptune is something much more interesting, and it ties directly in with the television theory. If you haven't seen that video, it basically proves that the entire show Spongebob Squarepants is actually a nature documentary being filmed by scuba divers, and many of the elements we see throughout the series are secretly set up by the showrunners to make sure that the show is more entertaining and profitable. And this applies to the Spongebob movie as well. There's promotional art and even a commercial that acknowledges the fact that it's just a movie being filmed. Oh, huh? SpongeBob, what kind of jellyfish is that? Hey guys, it's Carlos from the Zone. Can you tell us about your latest adventure? Well, this one adventure we had was a real Lulu. You mean when we went after Neptune's crown? It seemed bigger than our usual adventures. Yes, and with fewer interruptions. Well, thanks guys. We'll see you in the movie. Movie? What's that? I don't know. I think the real reason why Neptune looks so different in the movie is because the filmmakers couldn't get the real King Neptune, the literal god of the sea, to show up for a movie. So they hired an actor to pretend to be the king. And there is actually a ton of evidence in the show to support this. King Neptune is supposed to live in the great city of Atlantis, but in the movie he just lives in some random sand castle, almost like they just built a discount version for the movie. But the real evidence comes from season 10, episode 18, Lost and Found, where SpongeBob goes beneath the Krusty Krab to look for something in the Lost and Found. As he searches through the surprisingly massive collection of items, on one of the shelves we see something mind-blowing. The crown worn by King Neptune in the Spongebob movie. The entire plot of the movie hinges on the fact that Neptune thinks Mr. Krabs stole his crown. Why would Mr. Krabs have this now? Because this isn't just the Krusty Krabs lost and found. It's also where they store the props used by the SpongeBob SquarePants filmmakers to create the SpongeBob movie. If you remember from my television theory, Mr. Krabs is secretly working for the showrunners to spy on all the main characters. And his secret surveillance room was hidden beneath the Krusty Krab just like this lost and found. So it makes perfect sense for the showrunners to hide their props down here. And if you still don't believe me, we also see Spongebob's guitar, the Goofy Goober peanut hats, and the Magical Bag of Wind. All items from the movie that would make no sense being down here unless this was the showrunner's prop storage, and the movie King Neptune was just an actor. Well, that's one Neptune down. Now for the real mystery, King Poseidon. <laughs> Poseidon. 
In the third Spongebob movie, Sponge on the Run, the King of the Sea is yet again replaced by a new character, King Poseidon, the Greek god of the ocean. He actually does live in the city of Atlantis, except instead of the ancient royal architecture, it's a giant casino designed to make money. It'd be easy to say that these are just two separate kings that rule different areas of the sea, but they both claim to be the ruler of the seven seas. So how can two different characters both be the king of the same seven seas? The answer to that question actually has to do with a place called Camp Coral. Throughout the third Spongebob movie, we keep cutting back to flashbacks of a younger Spongebob and all the other characters when they all went to summer camp together. This was all to set up a spin-off show called Camp Coral that followed these younger characters. Now at first, I just wrote the show off as Spongebob following the trend of making all their characters younger to appeal to a younger demographic. It's been done before and it's never very good. They also completely contradict the continuity of the main show by having characters like Sandy and Spongebob meet as kids when we know they actually met as adults in the main show. Look, I am having a hard enough time figuring out this show's continuity on its own. I do not need another show full of contradictions to make it even harder. But the creators actually did something very clever to make the continuity work. The seventh episode of Camp Coral ends with one of the biggest plot twists I've ever seen from the show. So in this episode, Spongebob actually discovers the Krabby Patty secret formula way before it was supposed to be created by Mr. Krabs. But at the end of the episode, it gets accidentally destroyed by Sandy, and then we get this mind-blowing scene. This is Little Cheeks calling Big Cheeks. Come in, Big Cheeks. Over. Affirmative, Little Cheeks. This is Big Cheeks receiving you from the future. How are things going in the past? Your plan worked perfectly. The formula burned out before Mr. Plankton could nab it. Now it can be safely rediscovered in the future. I knew sending you to Camp Coral was the right thing to do. Over and out. Timeline preserved. Now everything can continue just the way it's always been. So Sandy used time travel to send her past self to Camp Coral so that she could make sure the Krabby Patty formula didn't get discovered before it was supposed to. They actually figured out a way to make this messed up continuity make sense. Don't you dare tell me this show doesn't care about its continuity. Can I also just say that this scene lines up perfectly with my television theory? A major part of that theory is that Sandy is actually a spy working for the showrunners and is secretly making sure everything stays on track. And then what do we see a month after I post my theory? Sandy secretly manipulating everyone to keep the show on track. Just gonna, just gonna give myself a little pat on the back there. But enough gloating. What does any of this have to do with King Poseidon? Well, this proves that Camp Coral and the movie that sets it up are in an alternate timeline. The events that have taken place in the show are not the same events in this movie. The continuity errors like Sandy and Spongebob meeting, or Poseidon being the king of the sea instead of Neptune, can be explained by this shift in the timeline. So there you go. King Poseidon and King Neptune are from completely separate timelines. That's why we never see any reference to King Poseidon in the show. And that is the Neptune theory. Huh. I mean, that, that wasn't so hard. I guess, I guess I'm done here. Neptune stirred up quite a gale tonight. He must be mad about something. <laughs> That's silly. Everyone knows Poseidon is ruler of the undersea. Everyone knows Poseidon is ruler of the undersea. <sighs> Why can't anything ever be easy? This is the clip that really made me decide to make this theory. The beginning of Season 5, Episode 19, Spongehenge, shows two fish arguing over whether Neptune or Poseidon is the real ruler of the sea. It's like the creators are directly telling us that both of these characters somehow exist in the same timeline, and it's our job to figure out how the puzzle pieces fit together. So, let's take a look. Despite both of these characters having similar appearances and personalities, there is one very important difference between them. Poseidon doesn't have powers. We've seen many times that King Neptune has magical abilities that he can use at any time, even without his trident. But in the entire third SpongeBob movie, we never see Poseidon use any powers or magical abilities. Except for lighting up his trident, but all he has to do for that is just flip a switch. And we know from the episode Trident Trouble that you don't even need to be a god to use the trident. And at the end of the third movie, we find out Poseidon is actually in terrible shape. If you remember at the end of the episode Neptune's spatula, Neptune briefly turned SpongeBob into a god, and we can see that having god powers gives you a perfect body. So why is Poseidon in such terrible shape? Because he doesn't actually have powers, only Neptune does. Even Neptune's wife, Queen Amphitrite, has to use technology to zap someone, unlike Neptune who only has to use his finger in the exact same episode. He is clearly the only one with powers, but why? 
To answer this question, we first have to understand the origins of King Neptune. Now, throughout the show, there is very little information on Neptune's past. I read the Wikipedia, I looked through the comic books, the video games, but I just couldn't find anything that would help me. But then I remembered there are Spongebob shorts, which are like many episodes that only air once, usually to promote something. So I started looking to see if there were any that could help us, and lo and behold, there is a Spongebob short called The Story of King Neptune. Huh. Yeah, I, I, I guess that could be helpful. This short is about Spongebob telling Patrick the origins of King Neptune, but it's not entirely clear whether it's true. The story of King Neptune. When King Neptune was a little Neptune, his mother set him adrift in a river. As he floated along, a radioactive meteor fell to Earth. An alien appeared and anointed the infant with Super Neptune fluid. Is that really the origin of King Neptune? Um... Sure. So King Neptune was abandoned as a baby and then given his powers by aliens. But Spongebob is holding an upside down comic book, so it feels a lot like something he just made up. And Spongebob is not the most reliable narrator. Unless there's something in the story that we can definitively prove, I don't think we can use it for a theory. Like, do you really expect me to believe that Neptune got his powers from aliens? I mean, we've never even seen aliens in the show before. Except, we have and they just so happen to also live in a city called Atlantis. Season 5, Episode 12, Atlantis Square Pantis, we see another completely different Atlantis, the lost city of Atlantis, a city that's home to a race of aliens. The Atlantean aliens traveled billions of light years to come to this planet and build their city. For reasons unknown, this great city disappeared one day, but no ruins were ever found. All the inventions you take for granted were given to us by the Atlanteans. They were a peaceful race of aliens who shared their technology, but then mysteriously disappeared appeared for some reason. And take a guess what we find when we look inside of that city. A massive sculpture of King Neptune. That story about aliens giving Neptune his powers doesn't sound so far-fetched now, does it? And that's not all we find. Neptune's Ascension. The only surviving painting from a great lost city of Atlantis. A painting created by the Atlanteans called Neptune's Ascension, aka Neptune ascending to his god status by being given powers by the Atlantean aliens. The story is definitely referencing this. There are too many connections for this to be a coincidence. So even though it's being told by Spongebob and details like the aliens appearance are wrong, the story itself is probably based on truth. And there's also a lot of evidence to support the idea that Neptune was abandoned as a baby. In Clash of Triton, Neptune is watching a soap opera in his bedroom and gets upset when his wife turns it off. Oh, Neptune, surely this isn't the behavior befitting a king, doing nothing but watching daytime television. Wait! Rochelle was just about to meet her biological parents. In the soap opera, Rochelle was just about to meet her biological parents. Maybe the real reason why Neptune's so invested in the soap opera is because he's never met his biological parents either. There's even tissues on the table next to him as if he's been crying. And the idea that Neptune was abandoned as a baby works perfectly with the mythology in the show. Neptune is the Roman god of the sea, but he is the only reference to Roman mythology in the show. Everything else we see is from Greek mythology. Mythology. In the episode Trident Trouble, we see a Greek chorus. Behold, we are the Greek chorus. We narrate this happy tale. Neptune once mentioned Zeus, the Greek god of thunder. So I say, look, Zeus, either you come up with more money, or Neptune walks. He also mentions Apollo, the Greek god of the sun. Now behold, my beloved home of Atlantis, a prize worthy of Apollo. Even in the city of Atlantis where Neptune lives, there's a building named the Poseidon, clearly named after Poseidon. So Neptune is clearly the outsider here, which is why he was abandoned as a baby. But if the sea is actually ruled by Greek mythology, then Poseidon should be the true heir to the throne. Why is Neptune the king in the show? Because after Neptune was given his god powers by aliens, he returned to Atlantis and stole the throne from Poseidon. This would explain why there's so much confusion over who the real king is. Neptune stirred up quite a gale tonight. Everyone knows Poseidon is ruler of the undersea. Legally, Poseidon should be the king, but Neptune took it by force. And that's not all he took from Poseidon. Neptune's wife, Queen Amphitrite, is the goddess of the sea. The Greek goddess of the sea, aka the wife of Poseidon. 
God damn, Neptune stole his wife and his throne. That is cold. And eventually, everyone did recognize Neptune as the rightful king. The pink fish who seemed adamant about Poseidon being the king completely changes her mind one season later in Clash of Triton. Wait a minute, King Neptune is coming here? Oh, I'm a huge fan of the royal family. I just love everything they do. And that is the real story of King Neptune. The reason why Poseidon is king in the third movie is probably because in that timeline, Neptune was never given his god powers, so he never stole the throne from Poseidon. Although, seeing as how Poseidon turned Atlantis into a big casino cash grab city, maybe it's a good thing Neptune took over. The lost city of Atlantic City. And that is the Neptune theory. That was a tough one, but we are finally done. See you next time, guys. Wait. Why is Poseidon City called the Lost City of Atlantic City? The Lost City of Atlantic City! I mean, the Atlantic City Park makes sense, that's a reference to the real-life Atlantic City, but why is it called the Lost City? There is nothing lost about the city, it seems like everyone's easily able to find it. The only other reference to a Lost City of Atlantis is the one with the aliens that gave Neptune his powers. Nope, nope, I, I, I don't care. I'm done with this theory, I don't need to answer every single little question. I am a hundred percent done. <sighs> Fine, okay, one more quick part just to tie up all the loose ends, and then I am done. Alright, here we go. So we know before the Atlantean aliens mysteriously disappeared, they shared their technology with the creatures of the sea. I think the self-proclaimed gods of the sea got their technology, like tridents and their other weapons, from the Atlantean aliens. In fact, the Atlantean guards even use golden tridents as their weapons. That's why the gods named their city Atlantis, to pay tribute to the Atlanteans that gave them their technology. But all of that changed when Poseidon became king of the sea. He betrayed the Atlanteans and used their own weapons against them to conquer their home and turn it into a casino city. That's why Poseidon City is called the Lost City, even though it's not lost. It's referencing the Atlantean city that was conquered by Poseidon. And the reason why the Atlanteans gave god powers to some random abandoned baby in the main timeline was so that Neptune could take the throne from Poseidon and prevent him from conquering the alien city. And the reason why the Atlantean city mysteriously disappeared was because they hid it so no one could ever try and conquer them again. And that is the Neptune theory I am done. <sighs> okay, that's, uh, that's another one done. Thank you so much for watching. I've been your host, Alex. We've got more on the way. I'll see you next time.